Mercedes-Benz represents some of the finest luxury automobile experiences on the planet today with top shelf performance, technology, far ahead of many other manufacturers. That all comes at a significant cost, but then you have to ask yourself, why in fact are used Mercedes just so cheap? Have you looked on the classifieds lately? And in case you thought about buying an older used Mercedes, the reality is there's a very strong possibility if you can't afford a brand new one, you probably can't afford a used one either. So I wanna share 10 key reasons why that is. Let's get into it now. Life's too short to drive boring cars. So one of the first expensive problems that you'll often find with a lot of Mercedes when you hit that 60, 70, 80,000 mile mark is on the front end of these vehicles and it's the thrust link and control arm bushings. Now what are bushings? Well, they're little rubber pieces that connect all your major suspension components together. They allow some of the fluid movement and it's essentially like the cartilage between your bones. It allows everything to move softly, smoothly without any vibration. But when that rubber starts to break down and they do, then it starts to get expensive. The problem is if you leave them alone a lot of times you get clunking and banging, you get excessive front end noise, and more importantly, what you end up with is a situation where the vehicle could become unstable at speeds and become very dangerous to drive in general. Not that it's hard to fix, but the sad part of the reality is you go in there, you have sway bars, ball joints, links, all kinds of parts in there, and then if you're going in there to do all the bushings, there's a lot of disassembly, and it becomes extremely labor intensive, and that just all adds up to thousands of dollars once you have to overhaul the front end of your fine Mercedes Benz. The second issue that you'll often find up with a lot of Mercedes, and it creeps in generally 80, 90, 100,000 miles, and it has to do with engine mounts. So your engine essentially is sitting there floating on a set of rubber mounts, or late model years, They've got rubber and oil immersed, so it allows a lot of fluidity, provides a better overall driving experience, more isolated from the engine vibration, and that's what gives Mercedes-Benz some of their legendary handling and performance where it feels like you're floating on a cloud. But even the older models with the pure rubber, they dry, they crack, and then they just stop doing their job, and then the vehicle starts to make noise and clunking because of the engine transmitting all that sound through to the chassis. Sometimes you'll hear, particularly on acceleration, or if you're throttling the engine, you'll hear the engine sort of rock and sometimes it'll start to bang and make a little bit of noises, that's going to be a problem. Later models with the oil-filled units can start to leak oil. That can be an ugly situation and it can be messy as well. A lot of vehicles can suffer the same fate. The problem is with the Mercedes-Benz, a lot of those parts are double, triple the cost of what you get, say, for example, in a Honda. Also, with the bigger, torquier engines, there's more strain and burden when you throttle it against the chassis, and those bushings have to work twice as hard as, say, driving a Toyota with underpowered engines. Again, it's another situation where it may cost you thousands of dollars to fix those clunky and dried out motor mounts. So the third problem is what you see on this vehicle right here, and this vehicle right there. You'll notice there's lots of rust already along the door and there's where the trim mounts to the door. Lots on the leading edge of the fender. Of course, you even get bubble bubbling away here by the antenna connection. A lot of times you'll get rust on the bottom edge of the trunk lid there. Sometimes you'll get rust in there. Look way down here, you get lots of rust forming in that area. Sometimes as well along the bottom edge of the doors as well as the bottom edge of the fenders right there starting to form. This is a real problem for a lot of Mercedes. And even on this particular vehicle, you can actually see it starting to creep in. I personally owned one of these. This is an ML series, the older generation of the SUV, but I'll show you. And these people clearly tried to hide a little bit of this. Of course, you've got these little flares right here, but you'll notice the rust starting to peek up under there. And you scoot down here and you'll notice it's also hiding, lurking under there. But I owned one of these a few years back and it seemed like every single time you put the vehicle away, took it out two days later, there was another spot of rust on it. You couldn't get rid of it. Don't know what's going on there. Poorly constructed, the quality control wasn't great, and these vehicles were built in the US. There might be a connection there, but either way, Rust is a big issue for a lot of Benzes. And on this particular model, you often saw it down there at the base. You'll notice just like this car is, you'll sometimes see it where the bumper meets the fenders. We also got it here where you start to see bubbling happening right there. Our car had that problem as well. And even just generally, every randomly, you'll get a little spot of rust that just pops up here or just down there. And we're totally anal about keeping our cars clean. So I did everything in my power to try to keep the salt and the grit and the gravel. I always washed underneath the fender wells really well, but that's unfortunately is a common phenomenon with many different Mercedes. Some better, some worse. But once you start getting rust setting in, it's gonna cost you thousands and thousands of dollars to start either rebuilding, repainting, doing body work. That just becomes a losing battle. 
Another common problem isn't particularly unique just to Mercedes. I actually had a BMW where it happened frequently as well, and that's window regulators. Sometimes you get window regulators that start to fail, and then you can get either slow opening, slow closing. And actually, in my case, one of my cars, it actually went clunk and it fell right off and the whole window went a little bit sideways and cockeyed and it became a real pain. The worst part is to get into it, a lot of times you're ripping apart door panels, that plastic and the insulation within the door. It's a lot of work and it's an expensive part to change out the window regulators. For such a nitpicky thing, it can cost you a lot of money. Window regulators, oh, what were they thinking? Keep it simple, folks. And the next issue is right under there. That's right, it's an exhaust system. It's the filtration. It's actually what keeps a lot of the carbon and emissions from going outside into the atmosphere. And just ask anyone these days who's been on the receiving end of catalytic converter thefts that they can be very, very expensive. Yes, a lot of people are ripping, cutting them out of vehicles, but more importantly, that's not what's going on with the Mercedes. A lot of the catalytic converters are often prematurely failing, and a lot of it has to do with the extra work that they have to do. One thing that will lead to a premature failure on catalytic converters is a misfire. So if you're running on a misfire, it's that odd oscillation or misfire that adds a lot of additional heat and strain to the catalytic converter, starting to cause it to overheat and and then that starts to burn out. When a catalytic starts to fail, then you have a situation where you have too much back pressure, the vehicle starts to run sluggish and weak, it doesn't seem to have the power it once had, and the worst part is we're talking three, four, five, six thousand dollars for a new catalytic converter if they happen to go on you. And they realistically quite frequently do, and a lot of Mercedes suffer from a very early failure rate. As little as 60,000 miles can be logged and you might see yourself replacing one. And another very, very costly thing that starts to fail as you get some of the more premium versions, for example, a lot of the E-Class, S-Class vehicles, a lot of SUVs. What we have here is a beautiful S550 here, Mercedes, beautiful late model Benz. But with some age, what starts to happen is the air suspension starts to fail because there's a lot of parts there within. We have an air compressor that pumps up and pressurizes the system. There's relays, there's also accumulators, level switches, but more importantly, it's the airbags. And the airbags are often usually at the back for self-leveling to provide that nicer driving experience, more consistent, keeps everything on the level. And it's often those airbags that are a key failure point. With a lot of these cars, you might come out in the morning thinking, oh yeah, let's go for a ride in the old Benz. Let's go, honey. Oh, why is it sitting so low in the back? I don't know, there's something weird. So then you turn the car on and it comes back up and you look at the car, then it's level again. And you're wondering, well, what happened? Why was it on the ground and now it's level again? That's because it lost air somewhere. So now what's happening is you turn it on, the compressor starts to pump it up and now it's on the level. But there's lots of parts that fail, like I already mentioned. And when the airbags go or compressor fails on this systems, it gets very, very expensive. It wouldn't be uncommon to have to spend three, four thousand dollars to replace compressor because it's getting weak because it's constantly refilling those airbags and the airbags themselves can cost a lot of money. So it gets to be a pricey failure point and just something to be very well aware of if you're buying an upper end car with all of those features. The air ride suspension is a big one and it's not unique to Mercedes. I personally had an X5 BMW and it had the same problem. I had to change airbags twice in its life and it's not a cheap venture. So here again, we have an older Mercedes, and if there's one thing that's pretty consistent is the engines and transmissions generally are very, very reliable in most Mercedes-Benz cars. Now, there are anomalies, but generally speaking, they're solid. However, it's a lot of the other equipment around it that can be a problem. One of the key issues that you can find is with the automatic transmission. Not that the transmission's a problem, it's how it's all connected. So there's a valve that controls the pressures and the transmission. The worst part is there's an electrical connector with 13 pins in it that plugs onto that valve body. It's not uncommon for that pin connector to actually start corroding. As a lot of these parts do, you'll notice the rust on the body. A lot of the other parts do too. Electronic parts and fittings and wiring connections all start to corrode as well with age. And when you have that, you have high resistance connections within that. And that then can cause a problem for current flow. You may not get the proper connection between those 13 pin connections and that valve body. What I would suggest is grab the car, put it in park, put it in drive. Put it in park, put it in reverse. Put it in park, put it in drive again. Give those a few strokes a few times. If it works, you're probably okay. If it doesn't work, guarantee there's gonna be some problems. Now, it's not that it's the most expensive repair. It is something to consider, but it's also something that you're gonna pay $190 an hour shop labor rate to get that sorted out. And that's where the dollars start to add up.
Now, another issue I personally experienced when I owned my ML500, and it's what they call a crank sensor. That's clearly another problem that a lot of these Mercedes-Benz are dealt with. Now, of course, in itself isn't the biggest dollars. It's an expensive sensor, yes. It's labor to change it, yes. But again, it's more dollars in the shop for what is normally a part that shouldn't really fail that frequently, but it does. And what it means is the car needs to identify with top dead center. It's all about how the vehicle times itself so it can run properly. Well, that sensor gives that feedback. And that sensor, at least in our particular vehicle, you had to actually get in here and we had to pull a wheel off and take out that shrouding in there, take all that out. And then the crank sensor was buried down here on the driver's side. I was able to do it myself, fortunately. But for many people who aren't mechanically inclined, it can cause you a lot of problems. And what the reality is, how do you know your crank sensor is failing? Well, you generally go out there one day and you go, oh, let's go for a ride. Let's jump in the wagon, guys. And then you go open the door, you go, you go to turn the key, and then you get a no start condition. The vehicle just cranks and cranks and cranks, but doesn't even want to start. That happened to me a few times. What I found was it did that once, crank, 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 it wouldn't start. I walked away five minutes, came back, and then it would start. And then this happened a couple of times and it got worse and worse to one point where it wouldn't start at all. I would just crank it and crank it and crank it. That's because the computer can't find that reference point, which is fed from that sensor. Once that sensor has gone, it's all over but the cry and the vehicle generally probably won't even run. It definitely won't start and you've got to get that fixed. Just another failure point. Now, another problem you can experience with a lot of Mercedes Benz are some of the issues with misfires that's right a lot of cars can misfire absolutely a honda a toyota a mercedes they can all misfire and this isn't necessarily me telling you to not buy these cars not at all on the contrary just something to be aware of because it does start to add up your bills and your maintenance costs in a short run and the reality is a lot of times mercedes benz consume spark plugs and coils at a much more alarming rate than most vehicles there's a lot of these benzes that need coil replacements as low as 60 70 000 miles where a lot of cars otherwise if you're talking about a honda you might almost run the lifetime of the vehicle without changing a coil or a plug but these just tend to eat them up higher heat more output more pressure and even my ml500 that i had it was a twin plug so it essentially also had two plugs two coils per cylinder it was very expensive i developed a slight misfire on one of the ignition coils but the other one was still running so it's very hard to diagnose i had to rotate them through it was a very expensive proposition had to change essentially all the parts so you think on a v8 engine two plugs two coils per cylinder that's a very pricey dodgy piece and again i get it it's maintenance but just to be aware it's not an inexpensive proposition when you're buying a used mercedes Another problem that I also experienced in two of my own Mercedes, the ML500, which I owned previously, and I explained about that already, as well as our current generation. We have a 2018 C300 Mercedes as well, and we also experience similar phenomenon, and that is the suspect quality control, at least on the cosmetics, body parts, panels, plastic fittings, components, are all very suspect with a lot of modern day Mercedes. Don't know why they don't last, but they're fragile, they break, and then it's very, very expensive to replace a ridiculous little plastic part that shouldn't break in the first place, but they just do. Let me give you some examples of some of the things that I experienced, like here. Right there, the sunroof on our particular car, it would function so the mo motor would run, but what it ended up happening was the sunroof sort of came off the track and then it got bound up. And so there were some plastic parts within that track started to bind and caused a problem. Very expensive to fix to get that aligned. And then we just basically, once we got it fixed, we just left it and never used the sunroof again. We had other problems. Down at the bottom, we had a little cup holder and an ashtray at the very bottom between the seats and the back seat there. At one point we went to open it and it blew apart plastic pieces everywhere. We could never really fix it properly. You know it's gonna be pricey to fix, so we just left it alone. I ended up taping it shut just because it was a pain and I didn't wanna spend the $800 for a new piece and assembly to get that all fixed up. It just shouldn't break, but it did. How about more? On a Mercedes C300, it was a coupe like this two door, and we had this panel right there. You'll notice there's that seam right there that differentiates this lower bottom section, which is plastic, and then the fender, which is metal. And it's at that seam that we actually had it pop right off right there. As you see, this one's starting to get a little bit misaligned right there. And unfortunately, we hit a set of tracks and that broke right off. The, it actually dropped by about a half inch and that rocker panel essentially became dislodged from the upper fender piece. Well, we thought, well, is that maybe, if, uh, is, was that just maybe a weird coincidence? I don't know, maybe. Why is that happening? Body panels flying off because you hit a rough set of road? That doesn't make any sense. We had another issue too. 
That little speaker on the door that you see just between the steering wheel there, that actually popped right out of our door panel, if you can believe it. It was the weirdest thing. I look over, all of a sudden I see that speaker actually in the door cavity. It's strange. We had to go into the dealer. They had to actually take the door panel apart and then they had to put that, reset it back in, fix up that rocker panel. It's just bizarre to me what goes on sometimes with some of this stuff. Why is it coming apart at the seams? But it makes me wonder what the overall plastic equality is actually like in a Mercedes. I don't know. Those are nitpicky, but just to be aware of, they can cost you dollars. Fortunately, we had warranty. Can't imagine if it was out of warranty and I had to take the car into the dealership to have that fixed up properly, that probably would be hundreds and hundreds of dollars just because of labor. And with all of that said, in case you're thinking about BMW, right there, why used BMWs are so cheap. Great reasons, you're gonna love that video as well. Hope to see each and every one of you on the next one. Catch you then, bye-bye.